does. I've been asked to say IDRP Forum as well, basically a collective uh, uh, venture sponsored by the Center for National Studies and the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. The theme, as you all know, is Cities Against Nationalism, and it's related to our project on Jerusalem. And if anybody is interested in uh, finding out more about the project or being on our mailing list, um, please sign up on a piece of paper that, that we'll leave at the back table near the wine and cheese. Um, before I announce our speaker today, I want to, I, I was remiss, uh, Joseph uh, chastised me last week for not mentioning the following week's presentation at the end of last week's presentation, so I want to give you a little preview of next week. Uh, we're uh, going to be hosting Dr. Schumann Provost, a uh, political scientist, a scholar of ethnic conflict from the London School of Economics who's done extensive work on Mostar in Bosnia, or Herzegovina. He's done some work on Northern Ireland as, as well. He uh, has recently finished a book you've probably seen on uh, Kashmir. Uh, and the commentator next week will be Dr. Toby Fenster from Tel Aviv University. So I hope you'll all be here this week. But we're really pleased to have such a great turnout for I know many of you have been waiting for several weeks to, to get a chance to meet him. Um, it's a thrill to have you here at, at MIT, David. Glad we have a chance to share from your to learn from your ideas. Um, as many of you have seen in the announcement we sent around about David, many people consider his work to have been the single most important, influential, and imaginative contribution to the development of human geography since the Second World War. His reflections on the importance of space and place, and latterly nature, have attracted considerable critical interest across the whole field of the humanities and the social sciences. For those interested in global capital and the cultural, intellectual, and political repercussions of its changing flows, David Harvey's books and articles have been path-breaking and have set agendas of numerous disciplines, among them anthropology, sociology, urban studies, planning, and political economy. Um, his books include The Limits to Quote. I will start from the beginning, Social Justice in the City, uh, classic work in, in political economy and geography. The Limits to Capital, A Condition of Postmodernity, Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference. He has a new book out on imperialism and also a new book out um, just in the last couple months <coughs> for us, The Capital of Modernity. Um, and David is a professor of anthropology at the City University of New York. Um, our commentator will be Yosef Jabarin, who is a visiting Spurs Fellow at MIT this year. Many of you know Yosef. He holds a PhD in urban planning from the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning at the Technion, and a Master's in Design Studies from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. He's been a Kreitman Fellow at Ben Gurion University, as well as a Rothschild Fellow, and he just recently received the Tommy Steinmetz to work with Peace Research at Tel Aviv University. Um, and we will begin in our normal format with David speaking about 30, 35 minutes, and then a commentary from Joseph, and then we'll open it up for questions. So without further ado, David, we'll see you here. Thank you. Uh, first off, I should say, I, I don't know anything, well, I'll, I'll sit down, actually. Well, I'll stand up and walk around. Um, I don't know anything about Jerusalem, so I'd be very interested to hear what you come up with. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I have uh, various times looked at uh, uh, various forms of urban transformation and urban development, and I've been interested in it from all kinds of uh, standpoints. And about this time last year, I was invited to give a, a lecture to Amnesty International in Oxford on the theme of the right to the city. And so that I thought it might be an appropriate thing to sort of go over some of the things that I said on, on that occasion uh, just to see if uh, they resonate with you in any way and if so uh, how and how you might uh, be able to use them. <coughs> the starting point for my argument really begins with a, one of the statements I often like to quote from Robert Park and I like to start with Robert Park because he's such a conventional figure that uh, you know, people can't take exception to my politics on, as it were, the first line of uh, any talk. Uh, what Park said about cities was this. The city, he said, is man's most consistent and on the whole his most successful attempt to remake the world he lives in more after his heart's desire. 
But if the city is the world which man created, it is the world in which he is henceforth condemned to live. Thus, indirectly, and without any clear sense of the nature of his task, in making the city, man has remade himself. This is a very interesting kind of formulation, and I think it deserves it, it, that we should reflect a little bit upon it, because what it says, in effect, is that we make ourselves through making cities, and one of the issues that always arises when we're talking about making cities is also asking ourselves, what kind of people do we want to be? Who do we want to be, and how do we want to be? And it says something about the phrase, the right to the city, which, uh, of course, really comes from Henri Lefebvre, but which has been used in a number of different contexts, which says that the right to the city is not just simply a right of access to what already exists in the city. The right to the city should fundamentally be thought of as the right to change it, to make it more after our heart's desire, to make it in a different form so that we can remake ourselves in a different kind of way. Now, the difficulty with this idea is if you look at it historically, what you would see immediately is that the city has undergone remarkable transformations over the last hundred years. The rate of urbanization has been quite phenomenal. And at the same time, the way in which the city has been organized, ecologically, politically, economically, has undergone some very radical shifts, which suggests that if Park's thesis is right, we've managed to remake ourselves several times over in the last century into term, in terms of who we are and what we're about. And there is, of course, a considerable literature, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, about the impacts of tra these transformations on the city, on the way in which people think, the way in which they feel, the way in which they understand the world, the way they think about their social relations. And from Zimmel's famous essay, you know, about early 1900s uh, onwards, the famous essay about metropolis and mental life, we've had a sort of continuous stream of, as it were, uh, thinking at the environmental impacts of the city upon who we are and, and, and what we're about. But what this also suggests is that if we think about the last hundred years, we've been made over several times without actually being terribly conscious of what it is we're being made into. And if we arrive at a certain kind of point right now where we see divided cities, we see fragmented cities, we see uh, alienation, we see anomie, we see many of the, and, and we also see centers of excitement, we see you know, centers of transformation and change. If we see all those things going on around us, it's largely because these things have just happened. And without being conscious of our task, we have allowed these things to happen. So one of the issues, it seems to me, when we start to think about the right to the city, is to say, we should start thinking about our right to guide that process, guide that evolutionary transformation of what urbanization and urban forms are about, guide it in certain ways, which have in mind some kind of different political end, which have in mind the idea of restructuring social relations, of redoing many of the facets of who we have become in a very different kind of mode and motivation. And of course you will see this idea launched in various places these days, particularly in the environmental literature, but part of the problem with the environmental literature when they start talking about new patterns of social relations and new forms of community is it's nearly always rural they're talking about, they're not talking about cities and vast cities and so on. So I think what we have to do is to sort of shift our gears a little bit and say, well what are we going to talk about? Let's talk about this whole kind of process, this massive process of urbanization and think about how it is making us, and at the same time ask ourselves some questions about how we are going to transform it, so that it transforms us in a different kind of way. On this point, I think immediately what we would see is the following kind of difficulty, which is that cities are fragmented, they're divided, uh, they're conflictual. And one of the issues which seems to me we've got to confront head on is the whole kind of question of the nature of this conflict and where this conflict comes from and what it's about. I do not belong to the school that says that conflict is a bad thing. Actually, I think most progressive change comes out of conflict. That therefore, what we should be looking at is the way in which conflict reorganizes and reorchestrates urban life. Now sometimes, of course, this, the conflict becomes absolutely vicious. 
Uh, in the Paris book, for example, I was mainly looking at the circumstances that led into the violence of the Paris Commune. And the Paris Commune, uh, of course, uh, about 30,000 people were killed uh, in a sort of space of about 11 days in a very arbitrary, in a very arbitrary way, just in, 18, in, eight, in those sort of May of 1871. We see other forms of violence. We see divided cities. We, say, we see Beirut. We see Sarajevo. We see Belfast. And of course, we see Jerusalem, and we see all of the things that are happening uh, elsewhere, uh, in, in Bombay, Ahmedabad, and, and all the rest of it. So we, we've got a lot of violence around. And many people kind of say, I'm so frightened of that violence that I don't want to ever think about meaningful conflict. And I think this, however, is one of the things that I really want to, to emphasize here, that the transformations which we're talking about are almost bound to be in the midst of considerable conflict and considerable turmoil, and we have to be prepared to confront that turmoil and confront that conflict rather than simply wish it away by kind of having some sort of uh, notion of how the world should be different. Now in doing this, what I thought it was useful to do was to ask certain questions about the notion of the right to the city and think about it in terms of what that right might mean in terms of interventions in the urban process and how those interventions might, but might be mobilized. And if we look, for instance, at the way in which somebody like Henri Lefebvre set it up, it's very much about saying, well, if you're going to change the city, it's going to be through political organization, social organization, through street action, through politics, through, through, through those kinds of things. And it can never be done sort of uh, neutrally, some sort of bureaucratic fiat from on high. It's going to be worked out very much through struggle. But then the issue arises, exactly what are we struggling for? And what notion of right can we struggle for? Now, one of the issues that I've been very interested in over the years is the uh, idea of social justice. Say, well, okay, one of the things we might be struggling for is a socially just city. But then immediately the question arises, what do we mean by social justice? Now, there is one theory of social justice which uh, arises in Plato's Republic, where Plato has Thrasymachus say, uh, the powers that be always orchestrate the notion of justice to match their own agenda, and that therefore the notion of justice is always that which the powerful define. Now, Plato rejects that for some sort of saying, no, 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 that can't be, there has to be some sort of ideal system of justice and some universal principle of justice to which we can appeal. But then when you start to look at the various theories of justice around, you find all kinds of possibilities. You can be an egalitarian. You can be a utilitarian, a Benthamite. You can be a social contract theorist like Rousseau or, or, or uh, like John Rawls. Uh, you can be a sort of a Kantian, uh, wrong to one is a wrong to all. You can be a, a, you know, a, a, a cosmopolitan of some kind. All kinds of theories of justice exist. Uh, and you can even start to diminish the universality of it all, as somebody like Walter does, by saying, well, actually, we want local theories of justice, which are sensitive to, to, to kind of uh, uh, local cultural kinds, of, kinds of, of conditions. And at the end of the day, you find yourself confronted with the following dilemma. I mean, you find yourself, it's a bit like saying, mirror, mirror on the wall, what is the most just theory of justice of all? And at that point, you go back into the infinite regression, and you go through all the lot again, and then you go through them again. I mean, and then you, at that point, you get rather cynical, and you say, well, Thrasymachus was right, you know. Uh, it's just whatever the powerful say it's going to be. Now, this means, at this point, you, you kind of get yourself to the point that Marx got himself to about some notions of justice and right, which is to say, this is such a bourgeois concept, I don't want any more of it. The difficulty there is, as soon as you say that, what do, you, what, do you, what do you find? You find you're actually turning off a rhetoric which is a very powerful mobilizing force. The sense of injustice is a very powerful mobilizing force in political movements. You can't shut it off that way by saying it's irrelevant. You can't go to somebody who says, I'm fighting for justice, I'm against the injustices which exist in my city or in my life, by saying injustice is an irrelevant concept, uh, go read something else, you know, go read volume one of Capital or something like that, you know. What this then immediately does is to, is to problematize the notion of justice and say, when we start to look at the way in which justice gets used politically, we find, of course, immediately that different groups will use it uh, for their own specific purposes. The communards thought they were right. They thought they were engaging in just politics 
when they took back Paris from the land speculators and from the imperial power and military power and basically said, we are going to make this city our city again. We have been expelled from the city, we're going to take it back. So they were right. And this was their notion of justice. They were going to work in a just way around this. The monarchists who came in and killed them were right because they basically said, well, uh, monarchy, God, and private property, those are the elements of any kind of system, and we are right to take it back in the name of those things. So here you have, again, a famous principle which comes out of Marx, which says, both are equally right, but between equal rights, force decides. So in the end, the question of what is right is going to be worked out not by some sort of ruling power, but out of conflict itself. It's going to be worked out in the process of conflictual elements. So this then seems to me to be one of the elements that we have to put in, into the situation. Now as soon as, however, as you take notions of justice and right, what we then need to do is to start to articulate further what those concepts might mean and how we might use them. And on this point, the next step in the argument I would want to make is this. We have a habit of taking these concepts like right and justice and universalizing them as if they're universal principles which we then apply to the world. What we find is that often doesn't work. What we have to do, it's then said, is we have to relativize the principles. I'm against the relativization, I'm against the universality. Where do I go? What I argue here is that social processes actually set in train certain ideals and embed within them certain ideals about what is justice and what is right. And that therefore to critique a certain notion of justice or to even pursue a certain kind of notion of justice is to pursue a certain idea of what is a dominant social process, what should be the dominant social process. And if you want my famous example of this, you would go to something like John Rawls uh, in his book on, on justice as fairness. And what John Rawls says is, well, we want to have a theory of justice. And he wants it to be blind to individual circumstances. So he sets up a fiction and says, the theory of justice should be determined by behind what he calls a veil of ignorance. That you, if you don't know what, who you're going to be in society, what position you're going to have in society, then you would come up with some sort of notion of justice which would not be biased according to you know, your particular position. But of course, if you are totally ignorant, you can't make any decision whatsoever. So what Rawls does is to say, um, actually in this situation, uh, we need to know, have some information about the society in order to come up with some notion of justice. We need to know, he says, the principle of psychology. We need, know, we need to know the principles of economics and how the economic system is working. Now at this point you say immediately, well, which theory of economics is he thinking about? Bourgeois neoliberal economics? Classical political economy? Marxian theory? What, what theory is he thinking about? And of course as soon as you choose that theoretical framework, you've actually chosen very much about what the notion of justice is going to be. So in a sense it's that con connectivity between the principles and the process that starts to be fundamental. And I suggest that we should look at this, and this might be very relevant to the Jerusalem case, in terms of two dominant forms of power. And this is the central argument that I'm looking at in the New Imperialism book. That is, I want to look at a territorial logic of power. And I want to look at a capitalistic logic of power. And I want to argue that they're not reducible to each other. But notice, if I say they're not reducible to each other, that doesn't mean they're autonomous of each other. They're not reducible to each other, but they are tightly interwoven. And the big question that arises in imperialist politics and a lot of the time in urban politics is what's the relationship between a territorial logic of power and a capitalistic logic of power? The territorial logic of power is, of course, set up politically by territorial entities, political decision-making within territorial entities. We can think about a city, we can think about a state, we can think about a collection of states, we can think about, you know, we can think about municipal we can think about neighborhoods or something of this kind. It's a territorial logic. 
what goes on around the territorial logic. It's very much about trying to structure the world in such a way that the territory does well by some standard or other. The territory operates in such a way as to gather resources unto itself, improve the well-being of its inhabitants, some or all of them, and somehow or other do something which is going to be beneficial for that territory. And that territorial logic will work in such a way as to try to intervene in other territorial logics in such a way to gain some kind of advantage. In other words, you'll engage in geopolitical uh, maneuvering, you'll engage in geopolitical conflict sometimes, uh, you'll just, you just play the game of, 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 of geopolitics. The capitalistic logic of power, however, is very different. It's a kind of a molecular process. Capital flow moves from here to there. It's continuous over space. It flows over boundaries and borders. It moves easily, particularly money power, from one, from one uh, area of a globe to another. So that, so, so that the capitalistic logic of power, then, has a very different kind of spatiality to it. And that different spatiality, uh, of course, can concentrate on territorial logics. It can say, ah, oh, that territory is very good for us. I think we move into that territory because, you know, they're suppressing their working class or they're not enforcing environmental regulations or something of that kind. Or it can say, These lo this logic is too much here, we're going to go somewhere else, we're going to do something else. So the capitalistic logic is constantly moving around. The problem for the territorial logic is to create conditions which are somehow or other going to pull in that capitalistic logic. The problem for the capitalistic logic is to say, we need as many of these territories to be operating in a way which is favorable to our flow and to the things we do as possible. Because we like to put those territories in competition with each other. I have investment resources. Boston, you can bid against Baltimore. Baltimore, you can bid against Atlanta and all those kinds of things. Or, you know, the struggle for, uh, for investment or something of those kinds. So, so what we see is this kind of relationship between these two logics of power. And I want to argue, however, that these two logics of power don't necessarily work together in a very coherent way. That is, it frequently happens that the territorial logic, playing geopolitical games, starts to do things which are absolutely antagonistic to the capitalistic logic. In which case, the capitalistic logic generally kind of either has to change the territorial configuration and do something. Uh, by, by uh, subverting political power in a particular space, or it has to get out of there and go somewhere else. And under these circumstances, you find stuff that makes economic sense sometimes is going to actually take over and do something in relationship to this territorial logic, and, and therefore one subverts the other. So it's this kind of complex relationship which it seems to me very important to look at. And it's very important in defining things like what current imperialist politics is about at a global scale. It's very much about geopolitical struggles which are going on between, say, urban municipalities over development and so on. It's, you know, this, is, this, is, this seems to me to be the, 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 way to, the way to look at it. Now, this theme, then, suggests that the territorial logic is itself uh, frequently off on its own particular dynamic. And when it goes off on its own dynamic, it does things which are really antagonistic to, uh, to what capital is about. But within that territorial logic inheres a certain kind of notion of rights. That is, within that territorial logic there are notions of e exclusion and inclusion. Definitions of who is a citizen, who is not. Definition of who is included, who is not. Definitions of you know, conditions of entry and things of that, the things of that sort. So there is a notion of rights which attaches to territorial attachment. Citizenship, uh, citizens of, of, of cities and, and so on, so that we can start to think about that sort of, that sort of dynamic. And rights there are caught up with things like the rights to vote and the right to pay, uh, you know, to, to, to call uh, administrate, administrators of the territory to account, all those sorts of things. So there's a different notion, a very particular political notion of rights which comes out of that, of, 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 of a certain sort. This is a very different notion of rights to that which inheres in the capitalistic logic. The capitalistic logic defines a very simple set of rights. Those simple sets of rights within the capitalistic logic are simply that the rights of private property, of individualism, and of the right and, and of the profit rate trump all other forms of right. That is, once you accept 
the capitalistic logic, you are committed to a certain notion of rights. And you cannot do anything else. So if you want to critique the capitalistic logic, you have to critique the notion of rights which are embedded in it, and vice versa. Now what's interesting is, if you go to the UN Declaration on Human Rights, you look at it and you find it actually is about the capitalistic logic of rights, which are all up there front, up front. Individualism, private property, the rights of investors, and those kinds of things. So the UN Declaration of Human Rights is a pro-capitalistic document. It has lots of other interesting things in it, because actually what happens when you take that particular bundle of rights is you actually start to define a set of derivative rights. Freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of bodies from enslavement, for example. So that you can have many other elements within the UN Declaration, which are you know, freedoms of rights to, to, to organize. And, and, and what's fascinating to me is you start off with these pro-capitalistic rights in the sort of first few clauses of the UN Declaration, and then when you get to about clause 20, 21, 22, that sort of thing, it says workers have a right to security, security of, uh, of, of, their, of their life, security of their, uh, of their right to organize. So, so, so actually you find a bunch of derivative rights actually there which are very interesting. And those are the kinds of derivative rights which many of us actually do depend on, including the rights of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and all those kinds of things. So the UN Declaration is a complex document of fundamental rights and derivative rights. And those uh, often involve you in a certain kind of contest. Nevertheless, to accept the dominant system of capitalistic uh, uh, structure, what you will find is that you're accepting a certain bundle of rights. What happens, however, right now, and this is one of the dangers that occurs right now, is that we seem to be in an era where notions of rights are starting to become a real center of discussion politically, globally. And that the idea seems to be taking place that a regime of human rights on a global level is the answer to a lot of the problems. Well, some fascinating literature recently coming out, including in the last issue of the Socialist Register, there's a very interesting article which talks about rights as a sword of imperial power. And in fact, one of the ways in which you can ensure that this particular bundle of rights that I've talked about, which is in here in the, in, in the UN Declaration, uh, gets, gets generalized, is through imperial imposition. Imposition, if necessary, through violence. And one of the things we have seen over the last 20 or 30 years is a transformation of the territorial logic of power in relationship to the capitalistic logic. And that transformation looks briefly like this. Once upon a time, and I'll tell it as a fairy story if you like, once upon a time there were social democratic states. And social democratic states took it as their obligation to try to improve the welfare of everybody in the population to some degree or other. Consistent, however, with not necessarily destroying the capitalistic logic of power. The capitalistic logic of power got into crisis around 1970-73. And after that, we get the construction of a different kind of state apparatus called a neoliberal state. And the neoliberal state is about a different notion of rights internally to itself. The neoliberal state is simply about creating a good business climate. Full stop. Very, very different mission. And creating a good business climate doesn't necessarily does do anything whatsoever for the mass of the population. It does a lot for a certain group in the population, as we, as we all know. Now, how did this transition occur? I think this is a fascinating story. And it's bracketed at two ends by 30-year, almost exact 30-year time span. The first big experiment of the neoliberal state apparatus was 1973 in Chile, when Allende, social democrat, was overthrown and displaced by Pinochet. What did Pinochet do? He said, we're going to reorganize the whole economy. How are we going to do it? They called down the famous economists from Chicago, called the Chicago Boys, and the Chicago Boys came down and they restructured the state. And they restructured it around the notion of private property, you know, free market capitalism, free foreign investment, guarantee repatriation of profits out of the country. This is the first big experiment with neoliberal state. Margaret Thatcher, about 1979, looked at the Chilean experiment, as did the think tanks around her, and said, that's the way we're going to take Britain. 
So you get the neoliberal sort of revolution in Britain. You get the same happening in the United States. Then what does the IMF do through every single structural adjustment program it's done ever since? Force a neoliberal state apparatus upon various countries around the world every time they got into debt. And guess what happened on the 30th anniversary of the, of the Chilean coup? Bremer announced in Iraq a new configuration of how the Iraqi economy was going to, be, going to work. Total privatization of everything. Media, manufacturing, agriculture, uh, water, uh, utilities of all kinds, uh, banking, finance. Total openness to all foreign ownership. No barriers whatsoever to the repatriation of profits. The only thing they kept in, in place from the Saddam regime was a ban on unionization of the workforce. This is a total neoliberal project, and it's so interesting. Violence was used to impose this in 1973. Violence has been used to impose this in 2003. And this brackets, if you like, the neoliberal transformation in how the territorial logic is working and how the territorial logic is supposed to work. So this seems to me to be something we have to look at. Now, there's something interesting about this notion. What Bush said on the anniversary of 2001 was we're, we're giving freedom to the Iraqi people. He says, we will use our position of unparalleled strength and influence to build an atmosphere of international order and openness in which progress and liberty can flourish in many nations. A peaceful world of growing freedom serves American long-term interests, reflects enduring American ideals and unites America's allies. We seek, and this was, uh, he, he said this uh, just before the Iraq invasion, a just peace where repression, resentment, and poverty are replaced with the hope of democracy, development, and here comes the interesting part, it's no longer freedom, it's free markets and free trade. These last two having proved their ability to lift whole societies out of poverty. The United States, he really ended up by saying, will deliver this gift of freedom to the rest of the world whether they like it or not. Now, there's a very interesting statement from Matthew Arnold, who kind of said, freedom is a very interesting horse to ride, provided you know its destination. And the destination in this case is a neoliberal political order. Now, there's something interesting about markets. They're very egalitarian in some ways. And, and indeed, there is something about a sort of capitalistic kind of structure of, uh, which, is, which, which has certain uh, bourgeois virtues associated with it. And I think it's important to recognize what they are. The big problem, however, with markets, and this is really way we can best sum it up is an old adage which says there's nothing more unequal than the equal treatment of unequals. And the market is an egalitarian device which operates on inequality to increase inequality. The neoliberal era, the last 30 years, has increased inequality thousands of fold. And it's increased inequalities between spaces, it's increased inequalities within cities. So that's what inequality, that's what the neoliberal order is all about. It's about, you know, you know, making the rich richer and the poor poorer. And that's essentially the kind of world we've been living in for the last 30 years. But one of the other things about it is that there's a particular mechanism of making people poorer. And this was another of the big theses in the, about what the neoliberal state is about. What does the neoliberal state do? One of its big mantras is privatization. Privatization is good. Now, there's an interesting history of privatization. If you go back to the 17th and 18th centuries, what privatization meant was the enclosure of the commons. And actually, what the neoliberal state has been about has been using state power for a new round of enclosure of the commons. It's been enclosing things that used to be in the public domain. Privatization of water, privatization of, 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 of state enterprises, privatization of everything. I mean, this is the mantra. It allows capital accumulation to work better. Okay, so privatization is the answer. But it's an, it should be talked about as a new enclosure of the commons. And if you look at the degradation of common property resources, environment and, uh, and, and, and qualities of urban life and all kinds of things of that sort, what you would say is common property resources are being degraded. And furthermore, those common property resources that, that were won through class struggle under the social democratic state are being essentially completely dismantled. The one that's very interesting for us right now is, of course, social security in this country. They want to privatize it. They want to privatize another piece of the commons. 
How they're going to do it, that's another kind of question. They say it's bankrupt. It's not bankrupt at all. It's got a lot of money there. They've just stolen all the money to give to the rich anyway through their, their, tax, their tax cuts. So the privatization of the commons starts to become a very important element in the thing. Here, it seems to me, is a very big moment of, of political struggle. In the same way that was a political struggle against the enclosure of the commons during the 17th and 18th century, what we see emerging around the world is a global justice movement and an anti-globalization movement, or an alternative globalization movement, however you want to call it, which is essentially resisting the enclosure of the commons. And one of the, one of the, 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 the themes which is emerging from that movement in this sort of anti-Davos symposia, the World Social Forum and so on, is let's reclaim the commons. And here, it seems to me, is something that actually does apply also to urbanization. Let's reclaim the commons of the body politic of an urban life. Here is something to be fought for. And you can see elements of that. I mean, how did the Workers' Party start to organize in Brazil through places like Porto Alegre? Organizing around the idea of incorporating more and more of the population into a political and economic process. So these elements then are there. And what we have to do is to confront this process that I call accumulation by dispossession. A lot of what's gone on in the last sort of 30 years has been about accumulation by dispossession. Dispossession can occur in all kinds of different ways. It comes when, you know, pharmaceutical companies try to exert, uh, you know, just because they've got the DNA on, on basmati rice or something, that they sometimes say, well, you've got to pay a royalty from now on because we've got the DNA on this stuff. So the, the, the intellectual property rights uh, and, and, and so on is a, is, a big, is a big, big issue right now in terms of the ability to extract rents from what are, in effect, common property resources. So we will, we will find uh, that aspect. We find other aspects of accumulation by dispossession occurring throughout uh, a society, sometimes, uh, in that case, uh, by, by legality, by things like the TRIPS agreement, but in other cases, by violence. What has been happening in Palestine, it seems to me, is a lot of accumulation by dispossession. Except that it's not terribly consistent with the capitalistic logic of power. That's one of the interesting kinds of questions about that area. In what ways is the capitalistic logic of power being absolutely messed up by this political confrontation? And in what ways can the capitalistic logic of power be mobilized to do something about that particular confrontation? That seems to me to be one of the issues. In the same way, I think you can see that apartheid in South Africa in part got dismantled because capital at some point or other found it dysfunctional to its purpose and its interests. So it seems to me that some of these issues can be attacked by saying the capitalistic logic of power doesn't use it. Now, I don't like the capitalistic logic of power, so in a sense you're going out of the frying pan into the fire with, with some of this stuff. But nevertheless, there is a tension between those two right now. And, and it seems to me something has to be done uh, about it. Now, this accumulation by dispossession is occurring in urban areas all over the place. For instance, I think of gentrification now as a form of accumulation by dispossession in many cases. People being dispossessed of the right to be in the city. In the same way that the revolt in, in 1871 of the communards was very much about trying to take the city back from all the property speculators. You look at New York City and you look at what's happened to Manhattan Island and you say to yourself, it's become a huge gated community for vast, vast amount of, of, of wealth which has been accumulated in the city. It doesn't belong to the, to the rest of the city at all. The boroughs are out there. And I think part of the politics which should emerge in New York City right now is an attempt to take back the city for, uh, for everybody in the city rather than simply sort of say it's about Manhattan, it's about the financial district, it's about all those all those, uh, supporting all those things which, which bring in vast amounts of money into the city from the outside. So there is, a, again, there are, there are questions of this kind which need, need to be looked at. Finally, let me just say this. I don't think we will ever be able to resolve these issues without engaging in struggle. Uh, it's all very well to sort of sit around and, 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 and you know, and I, I like theory and I like to, to, to work with theory. I, it, but, but this is going to have to be worked out through action in the street. And here we find something in the history of urbanization which I think is, 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 is extremely important, which is that urban centers have often been centers of revolutionary transformation, sometimes peaceful, sometimes 
you know, through violence. But nevertheless, they've been centers of new ways of doing things. And there are many things which are going on in urban areas right now, which are extremely interesting from the standpoint of looking at alternatives. And on this point, I would make the following argument. Revolutions are not about sudden breaks. Revolution means a turning of the wheel. It means taking those things which exist in the present and reconfiguring them into something different. This is a theory that Saint-Simon had. This was actually the theory that Marx took from Saint-Simon when he kind of said, look, we can only make a revolution with the raw materials which exist around us in the present. Which means part of our scientific task, he argued, was to see what exists, understand what exists, and through critical engagement with what exists, come up with new configurations which can transform uh, the world and at the same time transform us. Because I would remind you that Marx actually had exactly the same sentiments as Robert Park when he said, we transform the world, but in transforming the world we transform ourselves. We can't transform ourselves without transforming the world. And to do that, a utopian moment is absolutely essential. An, imaginary, an imaginationary moment is absolutely essential. And the famous kind of quote that what separates the worst of architects from the best of bees is the architect erects a structure in imagination before making it real upon the ground. And here is a moment of imaginative engagement, which it seems to me to be central to part of what your project is about, is to try to mobilize an imaginary engagement in such a way as to pose a different problematic. But it has to be an imaginary engagement this is what Marx is saying, which is not based on some sort of outside utopia, you know, which is based on the elements which exist in the existing society. How can you take what is there, utilize it, reconfigure it, put it in a different di direction, dismantle some things, engage in, in, in the politics in another? This is a difficult process. It's partly a scientific process, it's partly a, a, a political process. And it's the engagement of, that, of those two things together which it seems to me opens up the possibility to construct cities more after our own heart's desire. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Professor Harvey. I, uh, I think now you believe that it's not easy to comment on uh, Harvey. <laughs> so just in order to defend and to protect a little bit myself. And I change my plan also. <laughs> I read his article. It's uh, four or five pages of uh, the right to the city and all my strategy built on this article. I will change it a little bit. And I will begin from the, the very interesting uh, uh, argument fascinating argument for me is the, the territorial logic uh, of power and the capitalist, uh, capitalistic logic of power. And I will argue here, and I will show you in one map, I have two slides, I will show you in one slide that, that the case of uh, the conflict of in uh, Israel-Palestine is about uh, not only territorial logic of power, but more about demographic territorial logic of, uh, uh, of uh, power. So, as we, we witness all in this uh, series of uh, lectures, we have um, a global uh, format. So, in the beginning, we have the presentation of uh, Harvey, which is more universal uh, uh, and global. And I want to put things more uh, on the ground of, to apply it more to the ground of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem. So, and at the end, uh, I don't want to speak about my structure because I don't have uh, that fascinating structure. But at the end, I want to, uh, to, to connect, to reconnect the, the, the idea of the right to the city and to, to, to Diane Davis' uh, concept of uh, cities against, uh, against uh, nationalism and to combine them and to, find, to try to find is there any solution for Jerusalem while emer merging these uh, two, two concepts. So, uh, I, I, I reading Harvey's and Lefebvre's on the right to the city, I want I, I argue that uh, that the right to the city in its uh, 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 description 
uh, from uh, uh, Harvey and Lefebvre is more, I think, more uh, Eurocentric uh, construct because it's based more on the citizenship, democracy, and liberalism of Europe and uh, North America. So how to apply this concept when we speak about uh, developing countries or about the other, the, the non-Westerns, such as in Iran. Today in Iran, women in the National Day, National Women Day, they try to, to celebrate, and most of them, of the protesters, were in the, in the jail, find themselves at the end of the day in jail. How can we apply this concept in Jerusalem, where we have very strong uh, territorial and demographic uh, and demographic uh, con uh, uh, conflict. So the liberal democratic uh, model in which um, nation state membership is the basis for citizenship in the right to the city, member membership is bas based on inhabitants. And uh, Harvey gives us two rights in this city. And to the right to the city, there are two rights. One is the right to appropriate urban spaces, which include um, the right to live in, in the city, to play in, to work in, to represent, to characterize, and to occupy. And the right to participation is the right to take central rule in decision making surrounding the production of space. And as Harvey wrote in one of his, uh, uh, of his book, is that is the right to change the, also the order of the capital uh, flow. It's to be, to, to be involved in, in changing this uh, uh, capitalist uh, world uh, order. So I'm taking these uh, two rights, uh, the, right to, the right to live, to play, etc., and the right to participate. I want to take them and to apply them to, to Jerusalem, in fact. And in general, to draw a map Let's call it a map of rights in Jerusalem. And generally, I believe that if we want to discuss uh, uh, rights when there is a conflict, we need to discuss, um, um, we need to test it uh, normatively. In order to, to, uh, to discuss such a topic, like if we want to discuss uh, rights in the United States, we must take and consider first of all is the rights the status of the rights of the African Americans and other minorities. In this case of Jerusalem, I want to focus almost only on the rights of, uh, of the disadvantaged and the occupied, and those are the Palestinians in, in uh, East uh, Jerusalem. So the story of East Jerusalem, it's in 67, East Jerusalem was uh, occupied by Israel in the Six Day War. And from the beginning, from the beginning of this conflict, of this uh, immediately after this occupation, Ben Gurion, the prime minister, in fact, reconstructed and claimed and reclaimed the logic of uh, territorial power, in addition to the demographic uh, logic of power. Both of them together merge, and he established both of them uh, uh, together. So he writes, for example, in the beginning, in the first weeks after the war, quote, Jews must, Jews must be brought to East Jerusalem at all costs. Tens of thousands must be settled in a very short time. Jews will, be agree, Jews will agree to settle in East Jerusalem even in huts. One should not wait for the building of, uh, of regular neighborhoods. The importance is that there should be Jews there. According to this message, the entire uh, uh, ministries and the entire planning machine uh, was uh, recruited to, in order to, uh, to accomplish uh, uh, this goal to change and to reshape the space of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem and its environment. Teddy Kolek, who was I mean, the main figure of Jerusalem, was a mayor of Jerusalem for about uh, uh, a quarter of a century, he himself believed in that and he tried has ha, had tried to implement uh, uh, this logic of uh, demographic and territorial. And accordingly, uh, the city of Jerusalem and uh, the, uh, the interior uh, ministry decided to, to control East Jerusalem through a new rings, two rings of neighborhoods that I can show you here.
So in the left hand, we have uh, Jerusalem east, um, the west, and east. This is the um, Israeli side. This is the Palestinian side. This is the um, armistic line, which called also a green line. It's not environmental line, or it's a, it is a war line. And this is the, the east. And what we see here is the development. This is the border of uh, Jerusalem, a new border, nowadays border. And what we see, all of these, the the blue uh, spots are uh, are in the in in East Jerusalem. These are the new neighborhoods, and they are deeply inside the West Bank, deeply inside the West Bank. So, in fact, this still has the whole story that the, the structure of the West Bank and East Jerusalem was completely changed. So, in the David uh, Kolek himself said about this that. Um, um, Uh, the two, the two rings, the two wide new rings of residential neighborhoods built in Jerusalem since the reunification within the new municipal boundaries, were designed to afford the capital urgently needed resources, as well as to form a barriers against possible redivision in the future, redivision of Jerusalem. So the, aim, the the main aim was not to have from the beginning two capital in this in this place. And in other, in the, in the protocols that I found it while I was doing my master at Harvard, uh, the title of my thesis was Planning Under Political Conflict. I found some interesting quote from, uh, from a colleague. He said in a municipality, in the council uh, meet, in a council meeting, he said, I'm like everyone here, upset about the Arabs' gro growth in and around Jerusalem. And in the master plan of Jerusalem itself, it's saying page number from 1978 in page 16, quote, every piece of land which is not populated by Jews is in danger of detachment and being given to the Arabs. Consequently, we must first build in the far periphery. So this is the far periphery deeply inside the, the, the West Bank. So what rights, to, to speak generally, what rights uh, uh, the Palestinian lost? What, what, what rights, basic rights, uh, that Harvey, that Lefebvre speak about? What, ha, what, what rights, basic rights, uh, were violated? Is it the right for property? I mean the right for uh, uh, territorial property. Uh, new report, new report say that 35% of the of uh, the land, territorial land in East Jerusalem were confiscated by the government. And the huge amount in other places, which is beyond uh, the East, uh, were also confiscated. Other right is the uh, reconstruction, uh, restrictions on, uh, uh, on movement for person and goods between uh, East Jerusalem and the West Bank. To tell you, East Jerusalem is more attached to the West Bank and Gaza and less attached to Israel in, in, in every single context. And their restriction of movement is harming their economic, etc. And now adding the wall and adding the men, the numerous checkpoints, it is impossible almost to move from this city to the other. So from this place to move to, to Birzeit University, sometimes it will take, it should take 30 minutes, sometimes it will take you uh, five hours. It's what happened with me when I had a meeting in Birzeit University. I was late for the meeting for five hours. And uh, the participation in the, the right to participate in the local government, the Palestinians themselves boycott the, the local government. Only between three to six percent of Palestinians vote, or used to vote in the, for the local government for the municipality. They boycott completely uh, in order not to give legitimacy to the, to the city. Uh, the right to work, the, this population is ex excluded uh, from the public sector. No need for further elaboration for this. And uh, for the right for basic municipal services, social services, any comparat comparative study between both sides would show that huge disparities between East and West. And the most important one is the right of for residency, the right of uh, residence. So according to the, uh, this is the most painful uh, uh, rule, in fact. 
the people in Jerusalem, the Palestinian in East Jerusalem, they don't have Israeli citizenship. They have residency. And each time, if you want, if you want to leave the country, you need to approve effectively that you are a citizen of Jerusalem. If you leave, for example, if you, if you leave Jerusalem for seven years, you cannot simply return back to be again a citizen. I don't remember exactly the years, but I give extreme example of seven years. So in a brief, uh, to, to, to use uh, Harvey's word uh, in his book, uh, The Condition of uh, Postmodernity about uh, time, space, uh, compression, these policies, geopolitical and demographic policies, in fact, uh, resulted in a demographic, geographic compression of the Palestinian uh, spaces. Simply, compression of demographic and uh, uh, territorial uh, uh, spaces. On the other hand, of course, it's made the opposite. It resulted in demographic, geographic uh, uh, decompression uh, in the other uh, side, in the Israeli side. So when you look today, seeing the map of the West Bank and seeing the map of East Jerusalem and seeing uh, uh, you don't need to be an urbanist or a geographer. You, don't, you need just to, to have eyes and to see the, 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 how the space, uh, the, how the geographical space has been changed uh, since uh, 1967. And the conclusion, this is at least my conclusion, that uh, we are celebrating now and witnessing the end of, uh, of the Palestinian geographies. And this is very destructive. It is very destructive uh, that the Palestinians are losing their geography for Israel itself and for uh, the Palestinians themselves, because this, in fact, prevent any, any future solution for having two states. In fact, we are, beyond, we are going beyond this solution now when, when both nations are now and to Reuven, they are living uh, together. Maybe this, the idea of one state is, uh, is good, but the Zionist movement, has, uh, which has the dream of uh, 2,000 years waiting to have uh, a Jewish state, etc., it's now creating a new discourse. Um, I call it self-destruction. So finally, finally, I want to, to, to go now to the cities against nationalism and the right to the city taking all of these rights, the violation of these rights, then how can we manage uh, to do anything with Jerusalem? Uh, one, one, one uh, uh, to quote uh, Harvey question, uh, Harvey questions related to the right to the city. He said the right to the city is not merely a right of access, as he said today, to what already exists, but a right to change it after our uh, heart's desire. And it's interesting to s that Harvey speaking about ha hard desire. And it's also, he writes, the air, he means the air of the city. The air is a bit polluted now, but it can always be cleaned up. The question is how to clean the air in Jerusalem and how to achieve the right to the city away from suicide bombers that kill some hundreds of innocent J uh, Jews and how to achieve the right to the city away from extreme terror, uh, away from humiliation and int intimidation, and how to attain the right of Palestinian in the city, the right to appropriate urban space, the right to live in, play in, work in, represent, and occupy. So how to achieve this? And here I have, a I, have a, I think, creative suggestion. Before I tell, I'm, to go to, I'm telling you the, uh, the, the suggestion, I want to, to, to say one, one important uh, uh, comment on the identity of the modern identity of the Jewish and Palestinian. As Edward Said tells us and as Rashid Khalid tells us, that the Palestinian identity, the modern Palestinian identity is reconstructed in two axes. The first is as a reflection to the Zionist movement, the, the Zionist movement, and in the, in the other axis, is that the Palestinian identity, the modern Palestinian identity, is reconstructed around uh, Jerusalem, attached to Jerusalem. On the other hand, the, the Jewish identity, you know, the, the, the Zionist movement, is, uh, which began as uh, 
secular national uh, movement also attached its discourse uh, on uh, Jerusalem, mainly after the Holocaust when five, six million uh, uh, Jews were, uh, uh, were killed only because they are uh, Jews, they, uh, they, prom they were prompted even more urgently to find a refuge, a space of refuge from racist uh, Europe uh, at that time. And they attached themselves to the discourse of 2,000 waiting for Jerusalem. And the Palestinians now, they have the claim on Jerusalem. So we have two uh, conflict, conflictual claims, contested claims in Jerusalem. So as an, uh, as an intellectual exercise, um, I want to suggest a different approach to the city, to Jerusalem, based again on city against nationalism and the right to the city. And the aim is to return uh, the city to its inhabitants far away from the contested religious and nationalistic claims. Uh, the aim is to release the city from the nationalistic burden of, uh, of the Jewish and Arabs and Palestinians. So how to do that? I suggest here just in order to take the poison from the city, I suggest that, uh, again, uh, only not as a political suggestion, but as intellectual exercise for tonight, is to have two capitals, not in Jerusalem, one capital for Israel in Tel Aviv and the other capital for Palestinians in Ramallah. This, I believe, might take all the poison of nationalistic discourse, all of this uh, burden of nationalism, uh, relig religions, etc., etc. We can take by suggesting just to move away the political discourse from the city. This is what Diane Davis said, uh, cities against nationalism. If you apply really Jerusalem against uh, two nationalisms, so maybe we can achieve some normal life for the city. Thank you. part of the right to the city it is importantly a right to reshape and reclaim public space. I guess I wonder why you move so quickly past Rawls. Um, because I'll, you sort of present the veil as, as, you know, as crouching behind it and then reconstituting these logics of capital and coercion. But when I read, see the veil, I think of it ensuring that when public claims are made, especially on places, they had supported by reasons that bridge differences rather than merely reflecting them. And in the cases you cite, you know, Puerto Alegre and Belo Horizonte, that seems to be what's doing a lot of the heavy lifting, is that now people in authority are forced to answer, offer reasons to a wider range of citizens who have a vested interest in the quality of their public spaces. And I guess in the case of Jerusalem, or, or deeply divided cities, it just seems to me that what these cases cry out for are reason giving across differences. And to me, that's all about roles. I, I guess it seems like that's sort of normatively speaking the only game in town. And I guess I'm wondering you know, why you move so quickly past it. Well, I think actually, actually I don't think it's the only game in town. I think that all of the theories of justice which you can look at um, have a certain valency. And so I, I uh, you know, depending on the situation. Um, I would, uh, but, but my point about Rawls is that that actually, depending upon how you define what exists behind the veil of ignorance, you actually come up with rather different dispensations. I mean, I, I'm a great, I, I chose Rawls in some ways because I like Rawls more than, more than I, I personally like Rawls more than I like most of the others, but the point is that you can't get very far with that until you actually specify what's behind the veil of ignorance. Behind the veil of ignorance, there it exists some sort of concept of uh, you know behavioral norms, but he doesn't specify what they are. Of uh, how the economy works, he doesn't specify what it is. So actually, you could come out of it, and if I if I if I if I put Marxian political economy in there, I'd come out with a completely different definition of how how the the spaces of the of of, of the city would be defined. And so, for instance, in Rawls, we don't see. Uh, very much about active class struggle, for example. Whereas if you put a Marxian theory of politics behind there, as opposed to 
in a sense, what he puts there, which is bourgeois liberal politics. If you put a Marxian theory of politics, political economy there, you get a very different kind of conception of, 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 of what justice would look like and how justice would unfold in a city. And what I objected to was the fact that people will read Rawls and say, ah, this is the universal principle which is derived without looking very carefully at what the connectivity is to those other elements behind it. So what I want to do is to say, not dispense with all the notions of justice. No, I want to keep them there. I don't want to abandon them like a lot of Marxists do. I want to keep them there, but I want them to keep them there in relationship to the nature of the social processes we're looking at and saying, if I want to change uh, the social process, I've got to change the notion of rights that inheres in those social processes, and I've got to, it's a dialectic between the social process and the notion of rights that inheres. And, and so, so it, it, it's looking at both of those uh, together. And what I'm objecting to in a lot of the human rights literature right now is that very often they treat it as some universal without any kind of notion that, that somehow this is it, detached from any kind of notion of a social process when, in fact, it's very deeply attached. I mean, the notion of, of sets of rights which Bremer is imposing on Baghdad is deeply attached to a neoliberal conception of, of, of how the economy shall work. And, and, and that therefore, therefore, you know, and, but then this is tre treated as, this is freedom in the abstract. And of course, we're, well, you know, who's against freedom, you know? But then it's, 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 it's the specifications that I wanted to get at. That's why I chose Rawls, because I think it's most clear in Rawls, because, precisely because of this veil of ignorance that he sets up, and then, and then what he presupposes behind it. And when you look at what he presupposes behind it, you kind of say, my goodness, this is an incredible amount of stuff that's <laughs> smuggled into this whole argument without, without a, actually explicating what it is. It is striking when you, those reasons come out of the veil, though. So Marxism comes out of the veil looking very different than, say, egalitarian liberalism or neoliberalism. But if the veils apply properly, they're f within what Rawls calls public reason. They're having to talk to each other, have conflict in a certain way. I guess that's the part where I just see Rawls as still having some use. Yeah, I don't, I don't I, no, I, I'm not saying it's useless. I'm saying what we have to do is to, is to connect it back into those, I mean, and, you know, when he kind of says we know the general laws of human psychology, and you kind of say, well, is he a Jungian, or is he a Freudian, or is he, or is he a Lacanian, or what is he, you know? I mean, is he, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, this is, a, this is a problem with, with roles because there's so much baggage in the background there that you kind of, when you start to think about that, you kind of wonder how all of this works out when you start to translate it into urban politics, for example. Yeah, well, Bish and then Julian and then Nora. I want to ask you to say a little more about these two logics of territoriality or, or territorial logic and logic of capitalism that you separated. I mean, what strikes me is that historically, the, in terms of territoriality as nationalism, of nation, nation states, was very much linked with the emergence of capitalism. So the two logics are, in a way, very well connected if we take nation state as the territorial entity. So what strikes me is the way you separated, you show the logic of capital, and rightly so, as you take us through the neoliberal period, etc. But what we are grappling here, I think, in this particular project is the illogic of territoriality, or the, or the ethnic underlying ethnic tensions that come out of territoriality. So in some sense, uh, in, my, in our conversation, we are more kind of like Albert Hirschman's, you know, the passions and interest, where interest is a better way of shaping society than passions based on ethnicity. And I want to push you on that a little bit, because if you look at the cities and how people's daily lives function, not just Jerusalem, but let's say Gujarat, which is India, which I'm familiar with, and you had the big riot there, what brought the people back together was the day-to-day -day life of their economic life, which is capitalism with a small c. So I want to push you under what context the logic of capitalism can be a progressive logic. I think, uh, you know, I, uh, there are many instances in which I think the, the capitalist logic is indeed a progressive logic, and uh, I think that it can play progressive roles in certain, certain circumstances. So. Um, so I don't, I don't, you know, that doesn't, uh, you know, that, I, that idea doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't bother me. I think the, the issue where I would, I would want to look at this is to say, you know, when we start to look at the territorial, I mean, I talked in very general terms about the territorial logic. Now, the territorial logic can be, of course, about uh, territorial expansion. And that seems to me is what's 
going on, on here. And, and, you know, Hannah Arendt has a very interesting kind of thing. When nationalism connects to imperialism, there's a, there's a, there's a profound uh, conflict between those two, actually. And this is the problem of European nation states becoming imperialist at the end of the 19th century for capitalistic kinds of reasons, that the nation state was going to be imperial. And Arendt makes a comment, which I think is really very profound, which says, the only way you can square nationalism and imperialism is through racism, actually. And what is extremely interesting to me is to look at the incredible sort of burst of nationalism in this country since 9-11 and the way Bush has pushed that and to look at the rise of racism that's gone on with it and racial, and, and racial characterizations that have, that have gone on with it. So I, I think this is a profound kind of thing. And I think here what you've got is a situation where it's a territorial aggrandizement. It's a, a, the Zionism has always been a Zionist project, which is different from the Jewish. You know. The Zionist project has always been, it seems to me, an imperialist kind of project. It's always had an imperialist kind of logic. It's always been about you know, dispossession of... But the only way you can do that is to kind of say some people are inferior, you know, by definition. And therefore you get the kind of racism that arises out of out of that situation. This seems to me to be one of the crucial things which is, which is involved in this, which means that, you know, part of, part of what has to go on, it seems to me, in relationship to this sort of situation is an anti-racist struggle, you know, and, 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 and to reveal the racism that's, that's involved, involved in this, in the same way that I think part of the anti-imperialist struggle in this country more generally has to be about talking about the racist overtones that are emerging and talking about it as a racist project. Because that's the only way you can really put it together around this. Around, around this. So, so here it seems to me, when we start to talk about the territorial logic, I want to say, you know, the territorial logic is not a static thing. It's always playing geopolitical games against others. And, it, and, and in imperialist situations, it's about taking over spaces in somehow or other and dominating them in either economically or politically or militarily. And so we've got a situation in Iraq where, yeah, I mean, the U.S. has taken it over uh, militarily, and uh, it's very hard to prevent that d dissolving into, into a, a kind of almost a racist uh, kind, of, kind, uh, kind of ideology. And, 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 and in spite of all lots of official disavowals, you can see all kinds of stuff bubbling up through the military apparatus and elsewhere, which is, which is a, a highly racist, racialized discourse, which is, which is making this connection. So I think that's, that's one of the ways I would want to go. Yeah, uh, quick, I think in brief to, to Bish's question, I think there is, uh, um, as I understand, these logics of uh, territorial uh, uh, logic and the capitalist uh, logic, both of them are um, um, dialectical. They have dialectical relation. In the case of uh, Jerusalem, uh, the government or the municipality, mainly the government of Israel, cannot go ahead without any constraints with the logic of ter with the with the territorial logic, I mean it cannot implement all the what uh, just cannot uh, only confiscate Palestinian confiscate Palestinian lands etc. for them and to dispose to the, the Palestinians from their from their properties etc. There is the other side of the logic of capitalism, which make United States uh, interested in the area and Europe interested in the area. This said, uh, mainly the United States wants to have very good enviro environments for, for, its, for the capital flow in the Middle East. And the uh, United States put all the time some constraints. We have the example of um, uh, Har Huma, when the government wants to build, uh, to establish massive, mass uh, uh, amount of houses in East Jerusalem, and the United States say, no, stop it now. And then it was implemented, this plan, but I think there is there's clear dialectical between both, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have a question, another kind of question. You have to speak I think up the and imperialism are congruent in that simplistic way. I think it's like saying apartheid and imperialism are congruent in South Africa. I, I, it's just too simplistic uh, for, for good argument. But I want to come back to your interesting point about revolution. Um, I really found to be interesting. You also used the word taken to the streets and use the 1871 coming on. What interests me is that, which I can't explain, is that from the late 18th century through the 
through, through the 1830s, through 1848, through 1871, there was a succession of taking to the street and public disposition of the guillotine and the destruction of people. Whereas in England at the same time, between Peterloo in about 1830 and Lucky Sunday in about 1960, only 15 Englishmen were killed by British troops or policemen. So how did two, the, revol the, the major revolution in the two great modern industrial cities take place on the one hand with people taking to the street and using local violence, violence of the state, and in Britain, as Paxton, Joseph Paxton said, we only use common sense and technology. I mean, you know, if our constructions are now to take to the street and change our cities to revolution, which of these two models, or are these, are there many other models? I think, well, there are, well, first off, I'd like to make the argument that there are many different imperialisms in the same way there'd be many kinds of empires. So, you know, I'm not arguing that Zionism is just fits into some sort of box called imperialism. In fact, part of the argument in the book, the new book out, is, is to say there are many different imperialisms, and we've got to look very specifically at the U.S. form of it as opposed to the European forms of it, and exactly the same would argue about the revolutionary kind of processes that have occurred. I mean, uh, it is still the case that the French take to the streets, and it's still the case that the French stop things happening by taking to the streets in the ways that the British don't seem to be able to do. And in many kind of ways, uh, it seems to me that uh, you know, street demonstrations start to be very significant. And we saw that in this country with the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. I think the February the 15th last year was a phenomenal kind of urban thing globally. And one of the things that is absolutely astoni astonishing to me is we, we, we don't learn something important about history. I mean, one thing I remember so crucially about the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations is we were demonstrating there and Nixon was, says he, he wasn't taking any notice, he was just watching a football game. And we got very, you know, we got very discouraged. It turns out when the Nixon tapes came out, they were absolutely scared out of their wits. And a lot of the time we don't realize the power that actually is there. And I think that, that actually we need uh, to recognize some of, that, some of that power and that the power does indeed, in some, um, some regards, lies in the streets. Now, there are other ways of doing this. It's not the only kind of political channel. Other ways can do things. The British system has often been much more sort of co-optational and therefore hasn't been, has been less, uh, less confrontational and therefore has tried to downplay that kind of, that, that, that kind of stuff. It's always been very fearful of revolution. Uh, I mean, the British were terribly fearful after what happened in 1848 on the continent, were terribly fearful after 1871, and actually trying to work out a political way of preventing that kind of thing happening. But look at what happened in Prague in 1989. Okay. Look, look, look at, look at what, what, what happened in, some, uh, you know, in Berlin around that time. I mean, here we, have, here we have people taking and taking back a city in a certain kind of way, which makes it absolutely impossible for political power to, you know, to, 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 to stay in, in place in the way it does. So I think there are, many, there are many ways in which these transformations can occur. And when I say, you know, we want to take back the right to the city, we want the right to, 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 to be involved in a certain kind of way, I'm saying we've got to look at all of those political venues and all those po political possibilities. Revolution is not simply about taking to the streets and climbing on the barricades and, and doing that. Revolution is, as, as Marx kind of said, a process. It's a long drawn out process. And, 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 and it's about turning the wheel. It's about, for example, making the derivative rights in the general, in, in say the UN Declaration on Human Rights, uh, fundamental rights, and the fundamental rights derivative. You know, making the rights of the market and profit rate derivative to, to, to the other rights. Or so, you know, turning it all around, turning it upside down. And, and uh, that's, that, those are the kinds of movements that we're looking at. And actually, right now, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of ferment. I mean, this strikes me, this is very much like the 1830s and 1840s in France. This is very much like the period, the sort of uh, 1640s in Britain. And when you read, uh, you know, Christopher Hill's thing, like the world turned upside down, incredible ferment of different ideas out there in the anti-globalization, alternative globalization movement, which can actually create 
uh, a new set of a new set of, uh, of possible ways of, of, of thinking, in, including also new modes of political uh, mobilization. I mean, the way in which the multilateral agreement on investment got derailed by uh, mainly by Greenpeace using the internet was an extraordinary example of political organization operating at a different level. You see what's happening to MoveOn.org right now in this country. You know, I mean, it's trying to do things, and, and now it's being told it's illegal. And the rep Republicans are trying to repress it to somehow or other, not having rights uh, to go on television and say Bush is an idiot. You know, they can't, they're not allowed to do that. You know. So this is, this is, these are the kinds of struggles which are, which are going on. I think we have a struggle in this country right now over the Patriot Act, a real struggle over civil rights in this country. And what we see is, for instance, Baltimore City Council says it's not going to enforce the Patriot Act. And has a big sign in the public library says, you should know that all of your stuff, anything you borrow from here can be inspected by the FBI. If you object to this policy, write to John Ashcroft at the following address. These are the kinds of things which, which start to turn things around. And so I think that those are the sorts of movements that need, need, you know, we need to look at. Nora, and then Nomi. I was uh, very impressed by your call for struggle. And I was thinking if many of the inequalities that you describe are shaped by capitalism, but are also a consequence of being in power. And when you explained at the beginning that there is no, there is no way to go beyond different claims of justice. You know, we always have, uh, it's always from a perspective. So what happens with being in power, in the sense that you talk about capitalism, that is also capitalism in power, and, what, and when you say a struggle, then what's next? Are we going to improve the system, or is it just more about keeping the wheel changing? But it's not a, an improvement at the end. Well, if, if you look at the I mean, I mean, for instance, look at the whole notion of legality uh, as, as practiced through the court system in this country and the Supreme Court. I mean, this is, a, this is a class notion of legality. It's a class notion of rights which is worked out. It's a definition of rights which uh, operates in the world of exchange. It doesn't operate in the labor process. When you try to bring that particular bundle of rights which are enshrined in the Constitution and uh, made, made great by, you know, the Supreme Court and all the rest of it and try and put them into the workplace or try and put them into pollution instances, they don't work very well. In fact, they work very badly so that, so that you have a certain notion of rights which are actually, it actually inheres within the capitalistic process, which is about, you know, market and all the rest of it. Our problem would be, well, if you come to power, how would you transform the notion of rights? Because if you come into power and you don't change the notion of rights, then essentially you've come into power and you manage a capitalistic system of rights. And, and therefore, it seems to me one of the things we have to do is to be prepared to challenge the notion of rights that inhere in that particular kind of process. This is a very difficult thing to do because then you're going to change the whole, start to change the whole kind of structure of legality in, in, in a system. And so, but again, often people are not aware of that in the idea of, okay, we've got a socialist government, but it doesn't change the structure of rights. If it doesn't change the su structure of rights, then of course everything's going to keep working in, in the way it was before. So having, having state power is not necessarily the same as actually being able to do something, you know, being able to do something with it. And that requires theorizing it, thinking about it, thinking about what the political project is. Naomi, yeah, we have no and then two more comments. Oh, three. Okay, three. Uh, I have three questions. I'll do it very briefly. Um, you emphasize two uh, logics, logic, territory logic, and, and the uh, Endless logic. And I look at Jerusalem and I wonder if Jerusalem doesn't exemplify a different type of logic. It doesn't fall neatly into the category, definitely not a capitalist logic. And I'm not 100% prepared to sure that it does fall into territorial logic. Probably illogic. Or probably <laughs> illogic. Okay. Have you considered the possibility of something else, a third type of logic? a logic which relates to symbols, uh, to culture, to religion, which does not, is not encompassed by the two logics that you suggested. So that's question number one. Question number two is to both of you. Um, Joseph, you got out of dealing with the issue of struggle by putting uh, the capital of Israel in Tel Aviv and the capital of Palestine in Ramallah. And I think that's precisely the opposite of what Dr. Harvey was intimating in his analysis. 
So how do you reconcile uh, these two things? That's the second question. And the, uh, the third question relates to struggle. I think there have been more demonstrations in and around Jerusalem in the last, since 1967 than virtually every other, any other city I know of. And I probably can back that up uh, statistically. Having said that, um, the kind of struggle you're talking about, the more demonstrations and stuff, any given day you can find in. But the problem, it seems the struggle is taking place in very different ways, uh, to a large extent, by um, separating between power and control. Israel has power, but does not have control over large segments of the city and its population. And how do you work that type of struggle into your analysis? That's the third question. I would probably argue with you about Zionism, but I'll leave that aside because it's like. <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll leave you to answer your third question because you know all about it, how you work that into the particular logic. Uh, the, third, the third issue you, you raise, see, the territorial logic, uh, again, the, the, you, this, is a, this is a simple dichotomy. When you break it down, there are multiple forms of the capitalistic logic, depending upon whether you're looking at finance capital or you know, property development capital, or you're looking at, you know, so, and exactly the same way, there are multiple ways of looking at the territorial thing, but the territorial thing at its base says there is some attachment to the land, to place, with some attachment. Now, how that attachment is set up, whether it's around symbols, or whether it's around culture, whether it's around history, or whatever it is, you know, the multiple ways in which the territorial logic is manifest. It's not manifest in one single kind of way. I mean, I, I simplify it for purposes of, of argument. So I would kind of say some of the issues you, you know, that you, 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 you wish to talk about can be, can be looked at in, in, in this kind of way. I mean, if I look at a parallel case to this, if I look at Belfast, okay, there's been a territorial logic of power which is going on, which is a struggle of a certain kind, and, and by the way, one of the key things that at least has quieted the situation in Belfast is the role of the United States. And I think if the United States took a similar kind of role in Jerusalem that, that, it's, that it's actually taken in Belfast, and by the way, I think one of the reasons why Blair stayed with the United States throughout this whole kind of thing is because the U.S. could try, create big trouble for Britain in Northern Ireland if it wanted to. Big trouble. And I think that the Northern Ireland issue uh, something that's bedeviled British politics for a long time, but there's a geopolitical kind of kind of kind of thing which is around, and it's not even a, it's not it's, I mean it's, it's always depicted as being about religion. It's not about religion. It's about national identity and national sense of belonging. It's, and of course we saw a territorial uh, kind of cleansing going on, a sort of shifting going on. So uh, I would I would argue that when when you start to think more about the nature of territorial attachments and how they work and all that kind of thing, you start to see a rather different. A rather, a, a rather, you know, it's, it, it's a rather more multiple kind of concept than simply, simply thinking about, you know, the nation state plunked down like this or a particular administrative territory. Yeah, I think to, to your question, it's, it's, it's absolutely, it's very easy to, as, you know, as, as an exercise to say, let's have two capitals in different places. But I want, want to show you, I have two slides. I have other one, which is old, I think it should work. Yeah, this one is a model from the Jerusalem uh, Museum, uh, Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Or, and this is the three-dimensional model, and it's from 1873. And here in this, this, this is the old city of Jerusalem. In this place, I see it's beyond, it was before nationalism, before the, the, before the, uh, the bloody nationalistic uh, uh, struggle that we are witnessing today. And this I can see, you know, I'm a little bit naive also. And we can see here mosque, church, etc., synagogues, and uh, uh, different communities living in the same place. And I perceive it as space. All of them together they have, as a metaphor, they have together uh, this fortification, these walls together. And this sort of space of trust for these people together, for this community together. 
This way, I think, just as, in, as intellectual exercise, just to take this bloody, because uh, I am personally, and I think most of us should be I'm sick of, I'm so sick of the demographic and territorial de discourse in this, uh, in, 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 uh, in our country. And today we are witnessing, we have more extremists in the Palestinian side, and the discourse of Hamas is very, very strong, based on religious claims. And also the right wing, Israeli right wing, we know that's very strong. In any future election in the next some decades, I believe, the right is very strong. And they got stronger and stronger every day. And this based on the discourse of, the religious discourse. I just want to say, let's take them, let's take all of this attachment to the stones of Jerusalem, which, is, which are not interesting for me at all. I'm not interested in, in stones. I'm more interested in people and their life. This so why I think just to give us uh, what this will do to us if we have just rid of few of our claims. Maybe we should take all three and then... Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying, pile them okay. all at once, you know. So, because there may be some overlap in the commentary, then we'll let okay. David and Yosef um, respond. So, you give yours, then Zach, Lina. Actually, I'm going to go on trying to overlap with both of them. I'm talking about... He did mention some that um, the new plan, uh, this, there is this new logic of capitalism and it's going all around the city, but there is also a new trend of participation in the city. I mean, things have shifted in several cities, and there are several experiments and projects all yeah. around the world, like in Barcelona, or like in, uh, and like in, in Brazil and other places, where there are experiments of participatory democracy, where they define different ways of, I mean, of achieving mm -hmm. rights and achieving justice. Mm -hmm. And justice is becoming like an equilibrium right. between different kinds of rights or different kinds of competitive kinds of rights. So, I mean. I'm just trying to look at this uh, at this issue in, 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 Jerusalem. in Jerusalem and say, how would you envision some sort of a new participatory process where you could just have a different equilibrium? It's not by building two capitalists exactly, but by building up a system where, within the logic of capitalism, they could just uh, achieve some sort of and adjust this equilibrium among different parties. stories about using public space uh, as a way of uh, using right to the city. I'm coming from Belgrade and I have to agree that sometimes using public space in public demonstrations is really the only way, and it was the case of 10 years of demonstrating of uh, Belgrade citizens in the public spaces of Belgrade. I have to disagree that maybe revolution can be made in that way because we lost 10 years on the streets and I think that Milosevic, who was the, the, the reason of our protesting, was victim of capital power uh, more than the power of our, I don't know, citizen rights or whatever. So that was, uh, I would like to hear from you. Right. Yes, you give a line. Yes, I have one question to both of you and one question to Mr. Harvey. The first is um, about the concept of rise and its deployment. Um, the concept of right is, as usual, it's understood, is right, first of all, is right versus wrong, and right as abstract, and right as something that could be pinned to the level of the individual, not the background condition uh, that people work against. So the basically, all the critiques of right are, are this kind of critique, because they point to the background condition. So this is the Marxist the critique, this is the Freudian critique, and you need to develop a theory of right if you insist to use the word right into the right for the city. And I can't see what theory of right do you have. On the one hand, you are not Rawlsian, you're not Kantian, etc. And you still want to make strategic use of the word right. But why can't I replace the word right simply legitimate interest or um, desire or demand? So what the concept of right and what work does it do in your theory? It seems to me that you want to be radical 
uh, critical Marxist, etc., and at the same time to hold some uh, point of uh, liberal use of right, which is makes the theory for me. It's not clear the concept of right that uh, you, you you are working with. Um, too many questions, so I will drop my second. Okay, that's that, that you've got. All right. Um, three questions. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, the history of uh, what you might call urban social movements, if you want to call it that, is a very interesting history. They don't always work. Uh, why, sh why should, you know, why should they always work? I mean, they often fail. Uh, on the other hand, they uh, sometimes have uh, very transformative effects. Uh, the issue you're raising uh, also is that the transformative effects can sometimes contain all kinds of unintended consequences. And so one of the things that comes out of any pursuit of a right to the city is to transform the city, but uh, sometimes you find that you trans, you know, if you manage to transform it in some way, you may transform it in a way uh, which has rather uh, uncomfortable, I mean, this is a problem with all utopian planning. I mean, utopian planners uh, sort of make some place sometimes, and then, they, then, then when they get to live in it, they say, this is very uncomfortable, you know. So, I mean, it's not, it's not as if this is an unfamiliar kind of, kind of terrain, and I think we have to take that into understanding historically, and also in terms of what we do. But on the other hand, we don't sit there and say, well, I might have unintended consequences, so I'm not going to go do anything. Or, I don't know, I might fail, so I'm not going to do anything. I mean, these are the kinds of things that, 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 that you know, tend to disem, uh, disempower. And, and, and so, so I'd be very kind of nervous about that. And I think that, that what you're talking about is a lot of the, a lot of the social movements that, that, that now exist in some, some urban areas are actually very, very interesting. But some of them, of course, are, are moving in a very reactionary direction. There's no, the, you know, if you look at... Uh, uh, the sort of conflict which exists in, uh, uh, say, northern Italy right now, some of the northern Italian cities between sort of neo-fascist uh, movements, which are which which are which are pushing very hard. I mean, just because it's a uh, a social movement and a, an urban social movement doesn't mean it's quote good. Which brings me back, to, if you like, to a kind of question of rights. I mean, at some point or other. You have to make up your mind as to what you think the right direction is, and that's where that's my point about about sort of trying to connect the notion of right, taking it out of some abstract, you know, morality, and putting it close into what the nature of the social process is to sort of then try to define an alternative set of rights which are connected to some sort of social process, which is an alternative. It was going to be an alternative to circulation and accumulation of capital. Uh, a situation of rights, which is an, uh, a notion of rights, which is antagonistic to the idea that the rights of private property and the profit rate uh, trump every other right that exists. Because right now we have a situation where, no matter what kind of rights you talk about, in the, on a global kind of scale, given the nature of the neoliberal state apparatus, those are the rights which dominate and are going to dominate in practice, no matter what kinds of what kinds of ways you articulate it. So the, the, the so, so so we have to. You know, so in my view, what, what one has to do is to, is to make that reconnection between social process and the notions of rights which inhere in it. So that is where the theory is, is, is about. It's not about some theory of kind of, you know, you know, saying, well, I'm a Kantian or I'm a, I'm a Hobbesian or I'm a Rawlsian or I'm a Benthamite or whatever, you know. I mean, it's not about that. It's about kind of actually trying to identify much as I think was identified in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, a bundle of rights which attach to an, a completely different notion of, of how the economy is going to work, how social relationships are going to be constructed, uh, how identifications are going, to be, uh, are going to be accomplished and achieved, in, and, and how urbanization itself is going to unfold in a way which transforms the conditions under which we can kind of construct different mentalities and different ways of thinking. So it's that dialectic, that dynamic, which I'm looking at. And you can say, well, there's no absolute theory of right in here. That's correct. There is no absolute theory of right in here. It's, for me, it's a dialectic of motion. And therefore, the positionality I will take at this point, particular place and time is going to be different from what it might be at another point, depending upon the sort of paths that, 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 that are being taken by both the urban process and by political movements 
and and by by the general kind of uh, development, if you like, of how how global capitalism is working and and, and the like. So. Those are the sorts of issues that I would, I would want to put in the forefront of any discussion of rights. They should prioritize, they should condition. And I think it is the conditioning of, 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 of uh, it's if you like, um, you know, there's a Kantian phrase, the conditions of possibility. What are the conditions of possibility of certain rights making any kind of sense? Well, the conditions of possibility are given by the dominant forms of the social process around. And if I sort of say, well, I see two dominant forms, state form, capitalistic form, those are the two that dominate. There, may be, there are other, other forms, I'm sure, but those are the two that seem to me to dominate, and therefore we have to situate by saying the conditions of possibility of any kind of rights are actually conditioned entirely by the way in which those two logics of, uh, of power are working. But if I might just one yeah. thing, but the appeal of rights, in, when people hear the word rights and its appeal, yeah. let's make it sexy word as a Trump, you put it in the table, I have the right, is the idea, yes. which are you refusing in your argument, which is the idea of transcendence, because people have to have it after the veil of, beyond the veil of ignorance. If you, all you mean by the idea of right, that we are situated in some balance of power, we are enmeshed in certain relation of social situation interest, mm -hmm. then probably you're speaking about legitimate demands, but it's Nothing, it's not anymore have its magic power that it can convince people because it's not abstracted, it's not universal, and it's not individualized. So let's discuss how should we run society. Let's go back yes. to the Marxist idea. Right. Let's sit down right. as a collective and decide what's the best way to run society. And then Great. we should bracket the idea of rights. There's another point why right is not, I, I can't conclude on the right, because there's another point that makes right very um, the concept of difference. Yes. Because if, if you have it right, then it's either or. And the notion of difference now that kind of is brought into the. Well, one of the, one of the, one of the key rights, uh, you know, I, the right. is the right to be different, you know. So I think this is this is a key right. And, and actually. Well, it is, it, is, it, is a com it is a complex concept. And the point, the point is that it has a rhetorical power. And which you, which I, I absolutely refuse to give up, you know. And that rhetorical power is very important and very significant in terms of, and it's like justice, you know. I mean, I, can, I, could, I could talk myself into a situation where I say the notion of justice is irrelevant. We should bracket notions of justice. We should, well, yes, I know. Well, that's exactly what I was saying. There are levels of it and there are variations of it. But this, but nevertheless, these are important concepts. They're important mobilizing. Uh, in, in, in mobilizing political movements and, 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 and if workers, for example, are struggling, what are they struggling over? A lot of the time they're struggling over their rights, okay? And, and I think this is, the, therefore, you can't say to them, no, no, you shouldn't use that term. And I know, we know perfectly well when, when I'm sort of saying, look, I want to reestablish some sort of notion of collective right to the city. I know perfectly well what I have in mind by the notion of right, and it is, con it is, it is contingent, it is, it is definitional. But it is not, it is outside of this absolute kind of definition that somehow or other we got this universal and therefore I can persuade you by some universal argument that this is the right and this is the way in which right shall be specified and that is that. Because I know then you have actually secretly set up a whole bunch of contingent conditions which uh, may be unacceptable to me. Well, I'm going to, this is my territorial logic of power try to draw this to a close and just add a comment that I hope that we don't lose the discussion about the right to the city. So as much as we had a vibrant debate at the end, I think it's a very central notion that we want to pursue when we talk about Jerusalem in a variety of ways and maybe we can return to, to that in some of the upcoming weeks. So thank you, David thank and Yosef, for a very good